Good evening. I'm Francesca Zambello, and I'm coming to you from just having gotten my coffee at Stagecoach in Cooperstown. As you probably know by now, I'm committed to the idea of art as a catalyst for conversation, and Stagecoach is one of the best conversation spots in town. Tonight, we're bringing you a virtual town hall with Sister Helen Prejean, author of Dead Man Walking, The Death of Innocence, and most recently, River of Fire. You can join the conversation by submitting your questions and comments at the link below. I had the opportunity to meet Sister Helen when we produced Dead Man Walking at the Washington National Opera at the Kennedy Center in 2017. Her work and accomplishments are in many ways testaments to the power of story. By vividly telling the stories of individuals condemned to die at the hands of the state, she has opened up a national conversation about the death penalty. Sister Helen will be speaking with Terry Miller, a longtime friend of the Glimmerglass Festival. Terry is Senior Vice Chancellor for Strategic Initiatives and Chief Diversity Officer for the State University of New York, SUNY, as well as being a criminal procedure specialist. It was Terry who paved the way for Glimmerglass's ongoing collaboration with Attica Correctional Facility, where we have been performing each year since 2015. This is an important part of our activities and something close to all of us. I want to thank the Gladys Kriebel Delmas Foundation for sponsoring tonight's town hall. I'm sure it will be a thought-provoking conversation. So grab a cup of coffee or whatever beverage you like and settle in. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you very much. Sister Prejean, it is really an honor and a pleasure to speak with you tonight. Um, I'd like to start with a very basic question. How are you doing during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? How, how are you coping? How are you feeling? Well, well, first of all, you know, I stopped traveling on March 12th when COVID took over. I flew in from Colorado and haven't been on the road since. In 1993, when Dead Man Walking was published, this tsunami wave happened, the movie happened, then the opera happened, and I've been on the road ever since. So, and I thought it would be quiet, but I've been zooming, I've been zipping and zooming up. <laughs> All right. And I found it can be a very dynamic way of being with people. And uh, so the way I'm coping is that I'm continuing uh, the work. Plus we have a real, real, real active social media. We have Twitter with a huge number of followers and we get out there on all the issues to keep our voice out in public on like the resume federal executions that have been going on. And this outrageous case of uh, Fair Wayne uh, Bryant in Louisiana where the Louisiana Supreme Court upheld a life sentence for the attempted theft of edge clippers from somebody's garage, because he's a black man. So that leads us right into a really, um, a, a question about the re resumption of the federal death penalty. After, after 16 years without execution of federal prisoners, and after 106 countries have banned the death penalty, after countless exonerations, of death row inmates, the federal government reinstated the death penalty last year. What is the significance of this reversal for you? How does it, how does it make you feel after fighting executions for so many years? Feel, uh, feel, here's about feel. It so exemplifies that executions don't happen without decided, I wanna say decided decisions of prosecutors in some way to seek death rather than life. And we have seen that in pockets all across the United States. If there's one thing we know is that when the Supreme Court put their guidelines in in the Greg v. Georgia decision to resume de the modern death penalty in 76, those guidelines really didn't mean anything. They said it's supposed to be for the worst of the worst, but they left the discretion up to individual prosecutors to go after it or not. And now we see a pattern across the United States 
that where the most death penalties have happened, over 75% of executions in the Deep South states. It's where you have prosecutors who are politically motivated with their constituents to seek it all the time. So who do we have in the White House right now? Who is anxious to get federal executions going before he leaves office? And who is his, how, what, how shall I describe who William Barr is to Donald Trump. He's willing to do whatever he wants. So after 16 years, they decide to resume executions. They did them in the middle of the night against two of the people. They had 50 Justice Department of Justice attorneys working to kill a man in the middle of the night. They want these executions to resume and it's totally up to them. If when we do have the election, there's another president that appoints an attorney general that doesn't want executions, they are not gonna take place, which is what happened under the Obama, uh, uh, when he was president and under Eric Holder. 16 years, no federal executions. And you looked at the pockets where federal executions were, you know, where people did go after me. It was always in political pockets where it was beneficial for people to get the death penalty because they could be elected to office. And look at putting people's lives in the hands of politicians who can up their political credentials by getting somebody's deaths. We've had people, prosecutors in Louisiana that brag when they have run for office about how many executions they got. So consolidating political power. That you know, uh, that, you know, it, it makes us just, I mean, it makes me shake my head um, and, and think, you know, these are, these are lives in the balance. Um, and, and using, using lives, Terry, using lives to advance their political career. I mean, and we got to connect this to COVID. We have to connect this to COVID because of the lack of leadership in this country. We have individual principals in schools trying to make decisions about whether or not right. they're going to send. And we have how many people who have died. Right. That's lives in the balance, too, from a lack of leadership. And we have to look at the systemic way these things work. It's not just an accident, but it's from lack of leadership or a kind of leadership that wants to, to benefit from taking life. And, and, and it is in, inextricably bound up in race. And we're gonna talk about that, I think, a lot uh, yeah. this evening. But let me ask a, a, a question. Um, you know, this is a real tremendous time right now of upheaval in the country, right? George Floyd was killed, eight minutes and 46 seconds of a knee on his throat. There were demonstrations across the globe. America is in a moment of, of reckoning, right? People are beginning to wake up to systemic racism, what is that? I think people are beginning to see, it's not enough to ask, are you a racist or not? But do you participate in structures that privilege whiteness and disadvantage blackness, right? And, and white people are beginning to ask, what is our role in all of this, right? Um, could you maybe talk about how um, this has affected your work? And you know, in, in your experience as a white woman in a criminal justice system, that disproportionately affects uh, African-Americans and, and people of color? Yeah, well, the first thing for us as white Americans is, is to wake up. It's not that we're bad people, but you can be so insulated and so isolated, you don't see the suffering. I mean, so you hear people saying things like, oh, we colorblind now, slavery was over a long time ago. Why don't those people, they, why don't they get their kids educated? Why don't they go get a job? Why don't they? And it comes out of severe, fierce ignorance that they don't, that white people don't see the connection because they'll say, oh, well, my grandfather, he was an immigrant, but he got a job. That's what Justice Scalia used to say. We're Italians, we came in, my grandfather. And they have no idea what it means to walk into a place with a black skin walk into a department store with a black skin and have the house detective follow you simply because, or to have people tell you you're a credit to your, you're a credit to your race. You have no idea of these things. I, as a white woman, waking up, and that's the last part of River of Fire about waking up to social justice, 
was as a white woman to wake up to white privilege. And so then when I got involved with people on death row and I began to see how race worked in the death penalty system, overwhelmingly it's when white people were killed that the death penalty was sought. And it was rare that the death penalty was ever sought for the killing of a black person, 90% of the victims of homicide New Orleans. And you can't help but see those things. So one thing I could do as a white person was like, I'm woke, I'm gonna raise my voice. So I wrote the book. And so we have this active, very active social media and just wrote about this man that I just talked about, Fair Wayne Bryant, and called on my fellow white Americans to raise our voices for the struggle of black people. We who have never experienced the sufferings that black people have suffered simply by being black in this country. Wow. Um, so that that raises a question, um, I think, around. Um, well, let me find it because it's really it it it, it uh, riffs right off of that point, which is, um, you know, is it about uh, proximity? In other words, to have empathy for the other, do people need to be in proximity? Um, what is the secret to developing that that empathy? Um, and for instance, ah, I found the actual, the whole question. All right, your, move, go your, your move to Hope House in the inner city of New Orleans, right, was part of your awakening to the call of social justice. Um, so is it the fact that you were in proximity uh, to people who are very different than you? Um, you know, if, if we're going to begin to move hearts and minds in thinly populated monochromatic rural communities, how do we begin to do that? Proximity is everything. And you know, you quote in a favorite word of Brian Stevenson. Yeah. Uh, this a classmate of mine. Come on. A new remarkable guy. Anyway, but a steady, consistent plotter for justice who took cases of people for years and years until finally justice broke for that. Proximity is everything, see? There's a saying in Latin America, what the eyes don't see, the heart can't feel. And that's what opera does. That's what the arts do, of course. Brings people who don't know jack about this stuff and bring them into the journey. It's what happened to me when I moved into the housing projects. And African-American people became my teachers because they opened me up to the systems that were operative that were holding them down. See, I thought it was all just about prejudice, that some people were prejudiced. They were mean and they were prejudiced. It was individuals. And I had no idea how the system worked and why you got to tackle the systemic racism in it. And so once I became awake to it, then it's like you're thrown back on your conscience and you just go, what can I do? And you begin to get involved. White people need to join in the struggles in which black people are organizing, not set up your little white organization, and say to black people, why don't y'all come and be on a panel we have and we'd love to hear you talk about your experience. Oh, uh, we're talking about join the movement led by people of color that are really leading this nation in so many ways. I wanna just say one other thing about proximity in books. Lynn Hunt has written this book the Invention of Human Rights. And she talks about the power of story and how it can change mind and heart. And when you read a story about somebody and you see their suffering through reading the story, you can change your mind and your attitude. She talks about the epistolary novels of women in the 18th century and how men were reading those books. Richardson and Russo both wrote books about that women were writing to their sisters or other women about their sufferings, about being 14 years old and thrown in with an older man and forced to marry and who became the servant. And the sufferings of the women through these letters were exposed. Men read the letters and they entered into the women's experience and had empathy for them. And she traces this starts with this as tilling the soil to lead to human rights. In order to have human rights, 
to respect human rights for the prisoners in Guantanamo. I have a lawyer friend whose client was waterboarded 180 times. How do you torture people? You torture people by keeping yourself away from the human suffering and saying to yourself by demonizing them, they are not a human being as I am and allows torture. So she shows how the epistolary novels in the 18th century, Russo wrote this book, Julie, and got a letter from a military guy who when he reads of the death of Julie, who was so abused by the man she'd been forced to marry, he said, I wept buckets at her death. Proximity through story. Mm -hmm. And that's what Francesca Zambella is so on to with the art, see? Because that's what happens to you. I've, I've often said we ought to have seat belts installed in opera houses when that opens and they look at Dead Man Walking because it's going to take them on a ride. And they, they're going to need to be bolted in their seats. Wow. And that, the, it, the arts are truly powerful. And, and I, I love what you say about, you know, we may not always live, particularly in rural communities that are predominantly white, you may not be living next to someone, and someone or be in proximity to uh, people of color, but you can hear their stories. You can read their stories. You can, you know, begin to understand the, their experiences. Um, that, that's very powerful. Um, I want to... Uh, wait, go ahead. let me just say one more thing. One please, more thing. please. The video where we all watch that eight minutes and 46 yeah. seconds of that callous guy, his hand was in his pocket and he knew he was being videotaped and he didn't care because they've gotten away with it. And we all saw that. We saw that on. So what social media is doing and being able to video all these things happening in real life brings us into proximity in a way we never had before. That's true. That's really true. So let's take um, a question from, from the audience. This is a, a question for, from Maureen. Um, she says, she asks, I know that there are many barriers to success for ex-felons, but I would really love to prove to society that every person is unique, is capable of change and has a purpose. Criminals should not be judged their entire lives on one act. Have any studies been done to reflect the contributions of criminals to society post-release? Well, studies, anecdotal evidence abounds. I'm up in Montana right now, where I often come in the summer to write books. And uh, there's a bread called Dave's Kill a Bread. Kill a Bread. Dave's an ex-prisoner and he started making good bread. Uh, and that's an example of how somebody, everybody's worth more than their worst act. I don't know, I'm, if, and that's my lack. Maybe there are other people in this conversation that know about studies. You get in here in this conversation and educate us on it, but I just know from the people, the human beings I know. I, I could add a little bit from um, sort of teaching prisoner law for many years and, and, and studying incarceration. Um, for sure, there are more positive outcomes when there's employment and education, right? If people are brutalized in prison, uh, not given the tools to succeed in the world that they're released into, for sure, it's not going to be a successful reentry. Um, but if there is the opportunity for employment, um, if they learn a skill or a trade in prison, and if they get a college degree, the, the chances of recidivism are like in the single digits. Yeah. Right. So um, I think those are powerful things. But our, sometimes our, our instinct to punish and to other right, means that you know, these people, you know, I mean, if you, you know, you, you know from going into prisons, it's like the third world. You don't have to leave the boundaries of the United States to go to some place that feels very much like an undeveloped country. They're yeah. not, not computers. There's not, you know, DVDs, jump drives. You know, there's a whole world of technology that, that is not available to people um, in, in, in prison. And so unless they have the opportunity to... Um, to get a skill, you know, a trade and to, to have employment and, and get an opportunity to be educated, um, the, the, the consequences, the reentry is not going to be as smooth. So, yeah, you know what, too, Terry, 
just education. Yeah. It gives people a sense of worth that they can figure things out, that they can know things, that they're not stupid, that they're not always dependent on other people to have to explain life to them. That's what education does. It gives people a sense of dignity. We had this guy, Bobby Leonard, when I was in the St. Thomas Housing Projects at Hope House, and he used to come to talk to the GED programs for the young people to stay in school. And he just talked about how he robbed a bank, he got thrown to the DC jail, how this minister came and, and he said, write a letter to my mama, man. I just got to write a letter to my mama. Um, and the minister said, I will if you let me teach you how to read. And he taught him how to read. And learning how to read, because it gives you a sense of your own intelligence and your own dignity and that you can figure life out and make your way. I didn't know the deep connection of education. And I worked at our GED center in, in Hope House in New Orleans, how important. And it was just given to us white people, just given to us. I'm reading John Lewis's book right now, Walk with the Wind. That work in those cotton fields all day and he couldn't go to school and he couldn't go to school. And then when he gets in school and that mind of his begins to open up what happened with John Lewis. Yeah, and I, I'm, I should say, you know, I, I've been working on college and prison programs at, through the state university, and it's a really interesting thing. We uh, surveyed uh, prisoners who had been involved in education programs, and particularly uh, college and prison. And we, we actually, no, we surveyed the broader, um, we, we surveyed the broader group of, of uh, uh, people who were incarcerated who were interested in education programs. And we asked them what kind of education programs. And we were thinking, oh, you know, it'll be a lot of, you know, sheet metal working and trade. You know what they wanted to study? Philosophy, right? Okay. Free up the mind, right? Mm -hmm. Create literature, right? To go places. Because even though you're locked up, it doesn't mean that you can't go places. And mm -hmm. your mind is the portal to those things. So, you know, a, you know fascinating and interesting you know, um, uh, I think that, that's an interesting data point. Um, here's another question uh, from Michael. Sister Helen, in your opinion, what is the single most important thing we as a society can do to improve mass incarceration? Um, where should we focus our energy? I was truly moved by your book. Thank you so much for all the work you do. The big thing we gotta do is we have to move from being a punishing society, first demonizing othering people and punishing them for what they do, to restoring people into back into society. This is, of course, so affected by racism and a legacy of slavery. I mean, when you start studying the penal system in the United States, I mean, after Reconstruction, what just happened with this guy again for the stealing or attempted stealing of the hedge clippers? The one African-American on the Louisiana Supreme Court, uh, Burnett Johnson, said, it's the pig law. And that was after Reconstruction when white supremacists in the legislatures just said, if a black man, his life was like worth no more than a pig, harsh penal sentences on black people. And it continued like they, you'd get black people for loitering. You put black people in jail. They serve their time. They go to get out. They say, oh, you owe us for your food and your lodging. And they send them to a work farm and they're never heard of again. Yeah. So you have the penal work gangs that happen. Our Angola prison was that it's still called the farm. And you send people into prison for life, for life, for these long sentences for stuff that they did. So we may have to move from being a punishing society. And I do think it's because the public has been made to be afraid. These people are convicts. These people are con people. They're going to rob you. They're going to steal from you. They're going to that demonizing and make, making people afraid. And without proximity to meet real people, the American public has supported it. Up to now, it's changing now because we have people, you know, that are opening up to us like Brian Stevenson and others are just saying, let me bring you into the prison. Dead Man Walking does the same thing. Of the people who were sentenced to death, 
after Fer when Furman overturned death, very few of them ever returned to prison. They were all put in prison for murder. They were all on death row. They were all freed. Very few of them ever were recidivists and went back to prison. Sister Helen, you know, it, it sounds like you're hopeful. I am. Um, that, that, and, that, and, you know what? Please, tell, why? You want to speak about your hope first? Um, sure. Wow. Thank you. What, you're um, going to not hopeful in front of a nun? Uh-uh. Right. Oops. <laughs> That's a mistake. Um, I think... Uh, I think that I'm hopeful um, because of the response, for instance, to George Floyd's death, right? Because instead of just another black man being killed by the police, there were demonstrations worldwide. You know, like people began to say, this is just gonna keep happening uh, until something changes. And I think it's young people it's a new generation who's unwilling to accept that this should be the status quo in yeah. one of the greatest countries in the world. Right? Yeah. I mean, Generation Z, born from 1990 to 2010, have the most ethnic diversity of any cohort of young people in the country. But the reason I'm hopeful is what I've seen in the American people in going to every one of the 50 states and talking and meeting the people. When I came out of that execution chamber the night that Patrick Sonier was executed, that was 1984, April 5th. It was dark, I threw up. I had never witnessed a human being being electrocuted to death. I saw the whole protocol of government killing close up. And I remember thinking, you know, the American people are good people. They're doing this and supporting it because they've been made to be afraid and they don't know what's happening. And Thurgood Marshall, the first African-American justice on the Supreme Court said, the American people may say they support the death penalty, but educate them on it and bring them close and they will not support the death penalty. And I have seen that. And that is my hope. I know people can change. Just give them the information. And I didn't know the power of a book. I didn't know, I mean, what chance did a nun's book coming out in 1993 when 80% of the American people supported the death penalty, what chance did that book have? Well, I had an excellent editor, Jason Epstein, who taught me how to shape that story. And when Tim Robbins did the screenplay of Dead Man Walking, other than this great remark of, well, the nun was clearly in over her head, that it was the easiest screenplay he ever wrote because you bring people over to both sides of their own hearts. And boy, is that done in the opera. I mean, big time in the opera because you see the murder. You see it with your own eyes. There's no question, is he guilty or not? You meet him. He's the farthest thing from the, in the world that the person you want to like. He doesn't take responsibility, blames others. Bring it on. And that's the journey of the audience. And that's what I did in Dead Man Walking. But my hope is that people are good, but they can be very ignorant. And I was myself. Look how long it took me. I was in my 40s before I woke up. Even that, that justice was some part of the gospel of Jesus. And not just going to church and being pious and praying for people and being charitable. Can I say, I just love the way that you describe that transformation. Number one, you're a terrific writer but you bring people along in your journey. And this incredible book, um, the journey is amazing. And, and I want to go back to, uh, and, and read a passage from the beginning of that memoir and, and ask you about it. Uh, you said, quote, when you become a nun, you can never again step into your family home, not for a meal or a family reunion or a marriage or anything except the death of one of your parents. And even then, if they live in a city away from the convent, you may have to decide whether you'll visit before they die so you can say farewell or visit and attend the funeral. So that immediately made me think of a prisoner I worked with at Attica named Lou. He was given the choice between visiting his son in the ICU while he clung to life by a thread or attending his funeral. 
did training to be a nun in 1958 feel at times like you were in prison? Well, no, because I embraced it voluntarily. I thought it would make me a saint. But you have to understand, there was life as a nun before Vatican II, the great reform council in the Catholic church that happened from 1962 to 65 and life after that council. And after Vatican II, we were given back our selfhood. It was blind obedience before you just do whatever your superiors tell you. And that is what holiness is. And it fit right into women being compliant, women, women being obedient, women not being ambitious, women not being tough, all that kind of stuff that Kamala Harris is facing right now. And it was, but Vatican II opened us up to be alive to life that God has made us with individual gifts. We got to discover them and we got to be out there in the world. And nobody took that bit in their teeth. The Vatican II and its reforms more than nuns because we could only go up. We, you were ready to go up. And, and to become the selves and that my sisterhood, being in the sisterhood and the changes that happened in the sisterhood are who have made me who I am today. And I got nothing but gratitude for the sisterhood. Wow. Sounds like a remarkable community. Um, yeah. And, you know, even in the book, you, you know, you talk about how um, priests had a different kind of existence, but they didn't have the community that nuns had, which I... So does that make you a feminist, Sister Helen? With a capital, yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. What's the definition of a feminist? What's your definition, Terry? Um, someone who supports the full empowerment of women in our and society. The, yeah, and that women are fully human like everybody else. Period. What's the big deal? How can you say you're not? Yeah. I mean, could say I'm not a feminist. I'm not for the full equality of women. What do you? What yeah. conclusions? You know, the last thing in my book is my letter to Pope Francis about, hey, what about the role of women in the Catholic Church? We baptize just like the men, but what do you mean only men can be priests? Only men can be the spiritual leaders of prayer and spirituality in the community. What about women? And women, if why aren't we part of decision making in the church? And I do believe that the problems we are facing in the church today with some of the sick stuff that's been going on with the molestation of children, and it's because we're not healthy because the priesthood isn't healthy. I mean, to have a whole institution of people and you don't have men and women making those decisions and those policies together, you don't have women's voices and their wisdom in there. Same thing in the United States. We need women in the Congress. We need people. We need women in leadership. We need our voices. So when you when you speak of unhealthy, I'm I'm I I think of the the way in which um, and I, I'm curious in, in your experience going into prisons so often. Uh, you know, it it's not just the people who are incarcerated, right? That bear this, you know, that ha it's everyone involved in that system seems unhealthy, right? That it's unhealthy for everyone because there's this kind of oppressive system that doesn't fully realize prisoners as human beings, right? And so to participate in it means that it's unhealthy for you, you know, you're, so there's a lot of collateral damage, guards, um, civilian yeah. employees, families, and you know what, the more I learned about it and just even the rigorous unbending schedules of the guards, not to mention these guys that have to participate in the killing of a fellow human being after they render him or her completely defenseless. I mean, and I tell the story of Captain Cootie in Dead Man Walking where he called me in his office after five executions and he said, sister, I'm gonna have to quit this job. I started out as superintendent on, on death row, making sure everybody got their breakfast and kept order. Then they brought me in on this execution squad. I've been through five of them. And I come home afterwards and I get in my lazy boy chair. I can't sleep and eat. My wife knows not to talk to me. I'm gonna have to quit this job. And he did. He's the only one I met in the whole system from the governor on down that quit because of his conscience. But 
and they're told, just do your job. You're just doing your job. It's not your fault. Supreme Court said it's okay. Jury found them guilty. Just do your job. But their proximity mm -hmm. to that killing is what does them in. And then the guards are taught in their training. It's us and them. Do not trust anything they say. Even the chaplain that interviewed me before I became a spiritual advisor said, sister, you got to remember these people are the scum of the earth. And I thought to myself, what kind of chaplain is that? A great starting point, just like Jesus. Hey, scum, the last will be first. I mean, Jesus could never have preached his sermon on the mount when you're talking to nothing but scum, right? It was a whole awakening for me, Terry. I had no idea, no idea. That's a lot to take in. Let me go back to a, uh, some questions from the audience. So Casey asked, Sister Helen, what was your reaction when you heard someone wanted to make an opera out of Dead Men Walking? I had seen what the film could do. And when I heard there was going to be an opera, I said, bring it on. <laughs> on. And when Jake Hagee called me, he's a composer, this new little composer, he had worked in public relations in the, in the, the opera in San Francisco. And he goes, Sister Helen, we want to do an opera. And I said, yes, bring it on. Because I could picture... I don't think there's a fuller art form than opera because first you have live drama on the stage that brings the audience there. And then you have music to instruct the emotions that brings you through the journey. You know, the, this is the only opera where you have a minute and a half of silence. There's no sound. And you know what it is? During the execution of Joseph de Roche, the only thing you hear are the machines, that have taken over the human voice to kill him. And you could hear, I mean, the silence in the opera is so deafening, be in it such a moment. So anyway, I was happy that I had, I didn't know a lot about opera. I said, Jake Hagee, you gotta, you gotta teach me because I don't, I don't know, he loves to quote this. I don't know Boo Scat about opera. I'd seen one or two operas, but boy, do I love this opera and I see its powerful work every time it's shown. And I'm happy it's going to be at the Met. It's going to be at the New York Met, April 8th, COVID, COVID allowing. How are you involved in the making of the opera? Not too much, very much so in the making of the film, every line and scene, but I had to let, you have to trust the artist to do their work. So Terrence McNally, God bless him. I mean, he passed away this past year. He was the librettist and it's an American opera. He uses American language and it's, you got, you know, rock and roll in it. You got gospel music in it. You got all different kinds and you have to turn it over to your artists and you have to trust them. And I have not been disappointed in any of the art forms, actually, the film or the opera. I was blown away that an opera could be this powerful and to see the good work. And, you know, Terry, guess what's a question I'm asked more than any other about the opera? Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Sister, what's it like to see yourself come out of oh. that? <laughs> and there's Sister Helen singing My Journey. And you know what my answer is, and it's deeply truthful, and it is, it's not about me. I'm the prism of somebody who gets literally thrown in over her head and has to make her way and find her way. And I made a big mistake with the murder victims families at first by not reaching out to them. And that really comes out in that sextet scene where the victims' families are singing, you don't know what it's like. And the mother of Joseph DeRoche is singing, you don't know what it's like. And I'm just turning from one to the other going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I am sorry, because I was sorry, because I hadn't reached out to the murder victims because I was afraid. That's a really complicated situation, right? Dealing with uh, victims, you know, I, I've dealt with crime victims too, and, and had the same, you know, after making a short film about guys serving life at Attica, some of the the member family members of the victims of the crimes they're involved in reached out to me and said, "Why is their story more important?" Right, and that's a really complicated. 
you know, question to answer. Yeah. Did you have to answer that to to the victims, the families of the victims? Yeah, I. You know, why I, were you involved with them? What, Oh, yeah, that was a big thing. I mean, it's like, what are you doing being with the murderer? Nobody was there for my son, 17-year-old son. Nobody was there for my daughter when she was made to lie after being raped and shot in the back of the head. Where were you then? And of course, I, I, there was no way I could have been there then. But they're speaking out of their pain and their trauma and their grief and their loss. And I came to understand that, that when people were venting their anger at me, they it was this the trauma that they're going through. And I've also learned, and the people of the United States are waking up about this too. 62 murder victims' families in New Jersey testified when their legislature in 2011 were looking to repeal the death penalty. They testified, don't murder, I mean, don't have the death penalty for us. It re-victimizes us. Because they are put in a very public stage and every time there's a change in the status of the case, when a person gets a death penalty, the media is at their door and they can't grieve. They can't go to a private place. And it subjects us to them over what, 15, 20 years. So they just say, don't do it for us. It doesn't heal us. It re-victimizes us. And I saw that happening over and over and over again. And prosecutors used it as their ace card. Oh, we're going to do this for the victim's family. It's going to help heal them. Such a They get manipulated too, in some ways, right? The victim's families get manipulated. And oh yeah, big time. They're, but they're waking up to that more and more. And you can understand it. You can understand how the prosecutor comes to your house, says, look what happened to your daughter. We're going to get the ultimate penalty for you. They are so traumatized. What are they going to say? That we have individuals who have stood up and said no, but very interesting. We have story after story where prosecution, if they find the victim's family doesn't want the death penalty, they mute them. They don't call on them. They only want them when they're going to serve their purpose to help them get a death penalty. For the most part, not all prosecutors are terrible, but when plenty of them get in that current, that political current of that death penalty, they got to have that victim's family sitting in that courtroom and being with them all the way. Um, another question from uh, the audience from Susan. Susan asks, sister, could you comment on the effect of COVID on prison inmates? I haven't mm -hmm. heard anything in the media lately. Have any prisoners on death row died from the virus? Huge impact, huge impact. San Quentin, they had prisoners that came in from another prison they didn't put in any protections. And many of them have died. I don't have a figure to give you, but just picture yourself. You don't have any protection. Often they're not given the mass or protective covering that they need. And if you get sick, what happens to you? I know of one man at our prison at Angola, he had cancer and they went and put him in the ward with COVID people and he died from COVID. You don't have any protection. See, and if you're not respected anyway, if you looked upon, you know, like human disposable waste, first of all, even to be sick in prison is terrible because right away you're suspected of what they call malingering. You just want to get out of work. So you could have a terrible, you could have your gallbladder exploding and you're trying to say, I'm in pain. They go, yeah, yeah, you're in pain. So how many people have died because they don't get good medical care in prison anyway and throw COVID at it? But then we want to we want to encourage the wardens and the people in prison to do the right thing for prisoners and 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 just public support for that of support to prisoners. Please do the right thing. It opened up in Louisiana where we had prisoners and it was a sister of someone who had COVID. And, and she was trying to get help that he didn't die in prison from COVID. So we got involved and we got on our, on our social media, which is, if I can do a little plug, it's sisterhelen.org. It can bring you there. And we just raised our voice and tried to do what we can. And, and citizens need to do that. Where there's a prison in your area, find out what's going on and speak up for prisoners. 
Fabulous. I, this, um, that leads to it actually a, a, a comment from a, 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 the audience and then a question. So this is a comment from Maureen. Sister Helen Prejean, I would love, I would like to thank you for your advocacy to end the death penalty. I'm currently in a social justice class at Maria College in Albany, New York, a college founded by the Sisters of Mercy. We studied you and your work with the incarcerated for two weeks. Dead Man Walking was really an eye-opening book and movie. A Cooperstown student and friend of my stepdaughter's, Molly Perlman, worked with you during a college internship. It would be in I would be interested in volunteering in some capacity for your cause. So more people on the Sister Helen Prejean wagon, right? This is awesome. Um, well, and, it, and it raises a question. What advice would you give young people who are interested in advocating for criminal justice reform, uh, death penalty abolition, you know, um, uh, police reform? What, 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 would, what advice would you give them? You have to do what any person who's gonna become a leader has to do. You gotta dig in there and start getting your information. Where do you go for your information? Not just the books written by academics. You get in there with local groups. So you just start getting on your Google and you start pulling in local groups that are working for justice and you get in there with them. That's the first thing of being a leader is you get in there and you get your information. And then that fire starts burning in your heart and you get involved and you get in there. And the main thing about being a leader is you stay consistent. I remember the African-American civil rights leaders at Hope House were saying to us, man, what we don't need is some white people getting in here and you start to get involved, but then you say, ooh, I'm gonna go back to college. I'm gonna get me another graduate degree and something else. We need people hanging in for the long haul when this struggle and not just getting out just when it's not fresh. It's hard to be involved in social justice. It's hard to go to the meetings. It's hard to see the losses and where we're not making progress. And you got to be in there for the long haul. That's what makes a real leader, the commitment and the staying with it. That's powerful for, for, for everyone, you know, and, and students, you know, citizens, but everyone who's interested in, in being a part of change, right? It's not, it's not, you can't be fleeting and it can't be, you know, until it gets uncomfortable, but, but for the long haul. Um, here's a question from John in our audience. Every person jailed for a crime is individually sentenced by a judge. After that judge hears from a prosecutor, a defense attorney, a probation officer, and sometimes from the victim of the crime. If mass incarceration exists, who bears responsibility for that? The whole system does. And a great weakness in the whole system. Poor people cannot choose their own attorney. And the reason that it's only poor people who go to death row is when a prosecutor is up against a terrible murder. But this is a person with means who hires a crackerjack defense attorney that's going to take that prosecutor to the mat and every pretrial motion every bit of evidence, every single thing, and they might go publicly and lose, they're not gonna do the harshest thing. They're gonna make a plea bargain and settle the case without ever going to trial. That's the big weakness in the system because it's not just a racist system, it's a class system. Why is it only poor people in Louisiana, all the people? at Louisiana State Penitentiary, you don't find any rich people there because their daddy or somebody could get them a really good crackerjack attorney. And that prosecutor is going to think 50 times before they go after them. We have to deal with that, that whole thing. So, yeah, that, and, and so people who are vulnerable because they are economically disadvantaged, people who are vulnerable because they are the wrong race, yeah, we have a criminal justice system that um, is inordinately filled with folks that look like that. Yeah, and and again, getting back to uh, to Fairwing uh, Brian, look what they used on him was the equivalent of a three strikes law. They called it um, um, what do they call it? That it was he had done other petty crimes and it was on his record. So when he attempts to steal some garden head shears. He gets they said, a sentence enhancement. 
Yeah, right? I mean, and, yeah. exactly. You know about that. And wow. and so when you're poor, you do poor people's crimes. You do you're you're much more inclined to do petty thefts, more inclined because the law doesn't work for you. And and they bail those up and say, okay, there you go. And so now we'll just throw the book at you. So we're waking up on that. God, look how many people have suffered under that, though. I mean, it's just incredible that they've suffered so much. I mean, and we even had the 168 and county innocent people, like Glenn Ford was in on our death row in Louisiana 30 years because he had such a terrible defense attorney. The truth didn't come out at trial. 30 years, he was finally let out. He got cancer. He died the next year. He died within a year. 30 years. We say that in half of a nanosecond. And 30 years, 20 years, 15 years. And that's the innocent people along with guilty. Their, their lives don't seem to be worth as much to the system, right? In some ways. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask you, um, you've counseled so many people in their last days of life. How has that shaped your perspective on your own mortality? Huh. Boy. You know, you think a lot more. I, one thing it's done for me, Terry, by bringing up against death like this so close, mm. it makes me want to really, really live my life. You now, when you get up against death like this, and I just go, look at all the gifts I've been given. I've been given an education. I've been, I better use my gifts. I better be in there from morning to night and get in there to really live. I mean, and... You know, there's a graffiti on a wall in Northern Ireland. Is there life before death? For many, many people in our society, what kind of life we were made. I mean, that's the big thing about Jesus. Jesus never claimed to be a savior, but all he ever talked about was to be alive, really alive. I've come to that you may be alive and we call each other to be alive. I mean, this kind of thing we're doing today. We can walk away from this. I want to be more alive after I leave this encounter that we're having with each other today. We call each other to live, to really live, and not just get caught in this thing of looking like you're alive, but you just kind of tread in water going, you know what I mean? And young people are longing to have purpose and to really be alive and make a difference. But not just young ones, all of us. Mm -hmm. So that is about all the time we, we have. This has been an incredible conversation. And, and to close, we have an aria from Dead Men Walking, the opera that's based upon your first book. So I wanna thank you, Sister Helen, and thank all of you who joined us for this conversation from home. Here is Ariana Warren in the role of Sister Helen Prejean. Thank you.
Many of you will recognize this as the spruce grove. These are white spruce trees. Normally we fill this with picnic tables and it's a wonderful area to have dialogue and conversation before and after performances. We hope that you have enjoyed this evening's conversation in our third town hall of our series and that you will be back in the coming weeks. We have some wonderful glimmer glass glimpses coming up. Please check out our website and see what's coming. We Rome and I are signing off this week from Cooperstown. We are waiting for your return. He's going to get you right now. Thank you.